Hi everyone, my name is Robin and I'm the Learning Community Manager at Escolabs. My name is Emily and I am the Partnerships Associate at Escolabs. And welcome to Innovate with Data, a showcase of the landmark partnership of AIM, Dada Banato Incubator, Escolabs, and Accenture. Innovate with Data aims to empower and strengthen the Philippine startup business community through data upskilling. Today, we'll learn more about the use of data analytics and data science for early age startup businesses and the future of data and AI at enterprise scale. But before that, we invite everyone to join us for a quick poll. We may not be able to see each other face to face and even at the same time, but we hope you can still join us asynchronously for this quick poll. With your phones, you can scan the QR code or go to the link bit.ly slash poll to let us know where you are in your data journey. Are you already aware of the data gap in your business? Do you have the data available to solve the problem? Do you have a strategy and resources to address the problem? Answer the poll and let us know. At the end of our event, we will be sharing a registration form for the Innovate with Data community, and we look forward to connecting with you there. To kickstart our program, let's welcome Angela Chen, Squalab CEO and co-founder, for her opening remarks. First, I'd love to share a story with you, the story of Esquilabs and my story as a founder. So we all know that starting a company is incredibly difficult. And so especially in the early days, the reason why we believe in our innovation as the answer to the problem we want to solve is probably one of the biggest motivators for ourselves and for our teams. And so for us, we're playing in the edtech space for adults. And we believe that opportunities in the future of work will benefit those who are lifelong learners, who are critical thinkers, and those who can speak the language of data. Now, having a vision is powerful, but doing the work is much harder. So for me, when I was growing up, my parents always told me just to focus on school and the career track that a more traditional education would put me on. Never really thought of myself as an entrepreneur. So in the last uh, two and a half years since starting the company, I had to wear a lot of different hats at the same time, which was quite overwhelming. Um, and I'm sure many of you can relate to. And really in hindsight, I think no school would have really properly prepared me for what it actually takes to be an entrepreneur. There were so many problems to solve on a day-to-day -day basis, and there was no answer key at the back of a textbook that I could just flip to and check if it's A or B. And as someone who always wants to know the right answer and submit the right answer in the form of an exam, for instance, this way of working really bothered me. And I started to realize that when we have to turn our vision into execution, we're switching from asking why. Why are we creating this company? Why do we care about this problem? To answering how. I find myself asking questions like, how can I convince my co-founders to go with my suggestion? How can I get my team to buy in on the direction that we could go into? And how do we know if our product is getting traction with the people we want to impact? Now, what does the story have to do with data or with you? I think it can be summed up by this quote. If we have data, let's look at data. And if all we have are opinions, let's go with mine. I've definitely found myself maybe even saying that to my co-founders at some point. And I think some of you might have already found the secret, which is that there is no right answer to entrepreneurship. It's a mix of a little bit of everything and some luck. But if we want to improve our chances of success, then the quality of our decisions matter and how we can measure our decisions also matter. Do we have any data to draw upon or are we simply speaking from opinion? It's often a personal story, an encounter with a problem, a feeling that we get that propels us to found or join a startup. But then when we find, in order to scale that vision, we need to combine that feeling that we have, the dynamism of the startup narrative, the excitement that we have around what innovation can do, and combine that with something concrete like data. Like combining your left and right brain and growing into this superhuman being which startups really demand us all to become. And we're not alone. In the post-COVID era, many different actors are hopeful about a turning point for the digital economy. 
The Philippines is not yet a major player in the regional scene, but can we actually catch up to the speed and the scale of innovation happening already elsewhere? And there's a number of things that we can't control as founders, but one thing that is within reach is how can we improve ourselves and our team in the quality of our execution? And so that leads us to the purpose of the Innovate with Data community as a group of startup founders and teams who are coming together to help each other make data-driven execution a reality. And together, we'll be answering the difficult how questions that actually we're all struggling with. So there are three aspects to our purpose together. Upscaling founders and teams with data literacy to make, to make better decisions. Co-creating proof of concept data caps from projects with SQLAB bootcamp learners that can be implemented at your startup. And finally, collectively contributing to the data-driven mindset and culture of our innovation ecosystem. I'm excited about what we'll do together, and I hope you are too. I liked what Angela said of changing your whys to hows. And I think programs like Innovate with Data is a way to transform your why. Why use data to a how? Like what Angela said, we have three main pillars to innovate with data. Learn. These are the data analytics, data science, and strategy workshops and consultations we offer for the startup founders. From the workshops, we move to build, where the founders create a project plan to address their data problems. And in Innovate with Data, we have the opportunity to implement these projects with the help of a dedicated team of data professionals. And finally, we have scale. The larger goal of Innovate with Data, in partnership with AIM, DPI, and Accenture, is to advocate for the use of data in the business landscape in the Philippines. And we will learn more about that later on in our event. But for now, you might be wondering, how do I start learning and applying data skills for my startup? You might be feeling intimidated by, or da by data, or lost and not know where to start. And this is where our partnerships associate, Thea, comes in. Thea will be discussing the difference between what data analytics and data science can do for your business and how we at SQL Labs implemented these functions ourselves. Let's listen to Thea. To innovate with data. But today we want to tell you a bit more about the types of business problems you can solve with data and use, your, use ourselves as an example. You might already be familiar with these two concepts, data analytics and data science. While these two concepts are not mutually exclusive, there are some differences in terms of how you could use these for your companies. So this is what we tell our SQL Ups learners. A data analyst's job is to look through data to see trends and communicate what stories the numbers are telling. On the other hand, a data scientist both interprets and figures out ways to model the data. Data analysts are more likely to use off-the-shelf tools, while data scientists sometimes build their own tools with code. So what does that mean for you as a company? One simple way to think about it is that if you want to know what's currently happening in your business, you can use data analytics versus if you want to predict what might happen in the future, you can use data science. But what do they have in common? They are all solving a business problem. They all inform the use of data and they have specific business outcomes and impact. So now let's look at how we at the Scallops used both data analytics and data science to answer our business problems and how you can do it in your companies too. Let's start off with how we use data analytics. As an upskilling company, we're concerned about how our students are doing and if they are really learning. So for this example specifically, we wanted to know what the students thought about the pacing of the lecture for that day. So we collected their feedback after each class and the, and the results are aggregated and visualized in Google Data Studio, as you see in the image. If we look at the graph compared to the other days on day 12, there are a lot more somewhat fast and way too fast responses. So from this, this the decision that was made by the team was to identify what went wrong during that day so they can quickly adjust for the next class and to prevent this from happening in future cohorts. Now that we've shown an example of how we use data analytics, let's see some of the business questions you could ask for a data science capstone project. What patterns am I seeing in my user interviews? Which customers should we be targeting more? How can we cater to each customer segment? 
What features are driving user engagement on our platform? And how can we improve the value we bring to our customers? To illustrate one of the data analytics capstone projects we've had, we partnered with Mayani, which is also an AIM startup, to uncover insights on their cus customers' behavioral patterns using customer analytics, descriptive statistics, simple data visualization, dashboards, among others. So the students looked at different factors that influenced the buying decisions of customers, such as the time of purchase, number of items purchased, the time between one purchase and the next, etc. So understanding these factors enables a company to craft new products, strategize marketing campaigns, and increase profitability. After the engagement with Mayani, aside from consumer behavioral patterns, they also received results and insights focused on customer segmentation, competitive positioning, market basket analysis, and demand forecasting. So moving on to how we use data science in SQL Labs, we wanted to know what should we teach to our students in the future. So to answer that, we created an AI jobs model that parses through thousands of data jobs postings in the Philippines, Indonesia, and Singapore. So the, the job descriptions were scraped from popular job portals such as Indeed, Glassdoor, Calibre, and JobStreet. And these were analyzed using NLP techniques, which classified what skills, tools, experience level, educational attainment, etc. were needed for jobs like data analysts, data scientists, and data engineers. So this is a snapshot of one of our insights where we compared the top five data tools mentioned in the data job posts in Singapore compared to the Philippines. As we know, Singapore is very much ahead of the Philippines in terms of data maturity. So based on these two graphs, we see the importance of Python and SQL in Singapore. And going forward, there's a possibility that the Philippines will be following this trend as we become more data mature. With insights like this, we use it to inform our curriculum so that uh, what we're teaching stays relevant to what the industry needs. Now, the question you might be asking right now is, how can I use data science to solve my startup's problems? Here are some questions that startups have asked us. How can hyper-targeting reduce my customer acquisition cost? How can I predict fraud or default? How can I personalize recommendations for my customers? And how can I optimize my product description to improve sales? So, so far, we've worked with six AIM startups, namely Mayani, AI for Gov, Payruler, Digest, Autoserved, and Easy Fulfill. Earlier, we shared a data analytics project of Mayani, and now we want to walk you through their data science project. So for Mayani, they were interested in knowing how they could increase the basket sizes of their customers. Our students created a recommendation engine for their platform using RFM, market basket analysis, k-means clustering, and a priori, which is the algorithm behind the you may also like sections in e-commerce platforms. So the students also looked at what customer segments does Mayani have and the items each segment frequently purchases together. Through this project, Miami received a deployed recommendation engine that effectively recommends to customers items that have been bought together, which would encourage them to buy more and hence would increase Miami sales. Just like they explain, we at SQL Labs were able to use data science internally to better understand the gap in data education in the country and match that with the available or in-demand jobs in the market. As an edtech company, this data science project directly improved our business. In an innovate with data, we believe you don't have to be a tech or customer-based enterprise to make the most of data. With our next speaker, COO and co-founder at Escolabs, Aurelian Chu, we invite you to look at your own businesses and evaluate your data maturity level and what data is available to you or what data you can use to solve a gap in your business. Let's hear it for Aurelian. Um, so I will start us off with a little uh, bit of an example. Um, this is an example from Dropbox. Um, uh, Dropbox is a um, file hosting and uh, major cloud provider. Um, uh, but this and today it's it's a giant. It's it's a really big tech company. Uh, but at the time, Dropbox actually started out as, as a startup, just like any of you. And this is a story from very early on in Dropbox um, 
iteration uh, and journey. So Dropbox wanted to increase customer retention. And this is, uh, this is you know, very early on. They had a couple of customers. Um, they wanted to know how do we improve the retention. So they started a process very similar to some of the capstones we're looking at. They reviewed the data on their existing customer behavior. They did a data investigation. What they found is that the customers who shared a file were much more likely to retain. Why is that? They actually didn't know. Um, they probably have some hypotheses by now. But at the time of the investigation, they didn't know why. They just found that this was a result. Now, if uh, you're an early stage startup, this is a really important finding. Because even if you don't know why, you do know that you do want to retain customers. And so Dropbox ended up actually redesigning their entire site to prioritize file sharing. Um, they had a lot of initial directions, right? Like they could have been like, we could improve the capacity for file hosting. We could spend more on marketing. Uh, we could add all of these different features. And if you're not doing data analysis, any of those features are good, right? Like how do you decide which feature to do, which feature not to do? The reason that data analysis is so useful is that uh, Dropbox was able to identify this is the feature that we need because we have the data on which features are actually driving customer retention. And that is the entire theme of data analytics is that it is useful because it can give you quantitative evidence for you know, whatever it is, which customers are most important for your top line growth, which features are most important to product market fit. All of these things without data, you're just sharing your opinion. Um, with data, you can go into a direction like Dropbox because the direction of Dropbox is that a lot of companies started out doing the same thing that Dropbox did. A lot of companies died. Dropbox actually saw a big spurt in user numbers after they re-engineered their site. And now it's you know one of the leading uh, players in its field. So data analysis, even for an early stage startup can make a very big difference. So uh, in terms of stages of data maturity, I think I uh, just want to share a little bit um, in terms of where you might be, as well as uh, a lot of um, where you can improve. So a couple of things. There are a lot of companies, especially early stage, that don't actually have much data. Um, a lot of SMEs, the vast majority of SMEs you know, in this country as elsewhere operate like this don't have data, make decisions based on the founder's opinions, uh, personal you know, intuition, you know, it's okay. I mean, it's, it's, it's run the human economy for you know, 2000 years, um, but uh, it's probably uh, you know, slightly limited. The next thing is that you can do some data projects. This is probably where many of you are at. You already track certain metrics, right? Like the R metrics. Um, and you might do data projects from time to time, right? You have enough metrics to do projects. Uh, this is a very, you know, good start to have. And part of what we want to help you go to is um, if you're at the no data phase, you can move to the stage of having some data project. If you're at the some data projects phase, we want to move you to the data strategy phase. So in a data strategy, you have a clear strategy for what kind of data do you collect? Where do you find it? What do you use it for? Um, you start to build a pipeline, which we'll talk about later. You've got impact models for how data affects you. Um, and you're really setting up your products so that your products are not just you know, change based off of uh, you know, your opinion, they're based off of the quantitative evidence that you're constant, constantly getting from data. All right, so um, based off of this, uh, just in terms of data, um, this is a big question, what data should I be looking at? What data goes into my data strategy? Uh, I will, of course, be sharing these slides, so you will have access to them in the LMS. Um, there's a bunch of data around product market fit. Um, so product market fit, user metrics, these are the uh, data points that you want if you want data-driven product design, which is very, very hot in Silicon Valley right now. This is also where you get into the field of product testing, right? You wanna test different features to see which features actually are effective with your customers, um, especially because feature design 
is expensive. It takes developer time. So if you don't want to spend your developer time on a feature that doesn't work, you're going to want a data-driven uh, product testing approach. Uh, growth hacking is, uh, I think, the other big area that sees a lot of use in data. So this is all around customer data, building out your funnel analytics, your R metrics. You have a website. Why is my website seeing such a high bounce rate? Um, I have customers. Why do they churn so much? Um, you could answer that based off of your intuition, or you could actually do growth hacking analytics. And that's really um, a big field in data. Um, fundraising, this is an interesting one. Um, fundraising, uh, when you are looking at uh, investors, investors will look at what evidence you have for traction. Um, this is where what data you have collected is very important. Um, very sad to go to fundraiser or to investors and not have the data that you need in your data room. Um, the other one is uh, you want to showcase it. You know, this is the 21st century. You're a very tech savvy person. You're a very tech savvy founder. So if you can talk about data and sound smart, uh, this is going to make you look very credible to investors. So this is definitely something that they do look for um, is, you know, do you fit their idea of someone who is attuned to the technology trends of the moment? Um, and being solid on data fits in here. And uh, finally, uh, this is usually maybe for as organizations scale, this starts to get much bigger. Um, this is what corporate really cares oops, about in data, which is looking at your costs, right? Are you, uh, how well do you manage your cash? What are your cost drivers? Bunch of questions around here. Lots of data analysts make their money and salary from analyzing these questions. So with that, you can already look here and start to think about, oh, are there any of these four categories that I fit into as a company? Because if there are, then this is where I need my data strategy to uh, focus. And my data strategy will need to focus on how do I get the data to, um, to, to improve my outcomes in this area. Thank you, Aurelian. So Aurelian was able to give us another example of a business elevating their work by listening and working their data. He discussed the different levels of data maturity and the different kinds of data startup founders usually, usually collect, which can serve as a starting point for you and your business. So you might be thinking now, what makes IWD different from other incubators and fellowships? Innovate with Data, as we mentioned, is a collaboration between Escolabs, AIMDBI, and Accenture. To better understand Accenture's interest and investment in local and global startups, let's listen to Venture Manila lead Angelo Giolantin introduce the Accenture partnership for Innovate, Innovate with Data. Good day, everyone, and thank you, Escolabs, for the opportunity to join you here at Philippine Startup Week 2021. We at Accenture Ventures drive innovation through collaboration and inspiration as an integral part of the Accenture innovation architecture. Accenture Ventures is designed to be the bridge helping young companies realize their full potential and our clients harness the leading innovations being created by disruptive startups globally. Focusing on partnership building and educating and building awareness of the latest innovative startups globally and out of the Philippines. We help our clients power their enterprises into the future while providing our startup partners access to our technological and domain expertise across our G2000 client base. Our friends in the academe and the technology business incubators are crucial to realizing our goals in this area as they provide the all too valuable mentorship and acceleration that early stage disruptive startups require to succeed. Our partnership with AIM's Dadao Banatao Incubator and Esquilabs represents a core pillar in our strategy in that the future of work is in data. Data analytics and AI are opening the door to new possibilities for how organizations can grow and differentiate themselves against competition at an accelerated pace. More than half of the organizations with future-ready operations are already using data and analytics at scale. Reinventing how data and AI initiatives are executed against business strategy 
results in an organization that can realize a return on investment at speed. This data-led transformation goes beyond approach or discipline to be a complete reimagining of business through data. This means embracing data as you would human, financial, and intellectual capital, the lifeblood for businesses to grow and compete over the past few centuries. Thusly, we feel Esquilab's Innovation with Data program is so particularly powerful as it not only equips startups with this data-led transformation mindset, but also trains the ever so valuable data experts who lead and power these initiatives. Accenture Ventures bridges early age disruptive startups with global clients and through Escolabs and the AIM Dado Banato Incubator, we find and upskill these early age startups and give them the opportunity to join this network of companies. To date, Innovate with Data has partnered with 23 AIM DBI startups of various industries, majority of which aren't even in tech. They include health and even sustainability industries, and over 75% of these businesses have reported that after the first round of workshops and consultations, they now have high-level data strategies, and 88% of the participating founders have reported that they have identified a use case or a gap in their business that can be addressed by data. To better understand the data landscape in the country and data upskilling for businesses, let us listen to our keynote speaker for today, the Enterprise Transformation Lead of Accenture's Manila Innovation Hub, Mr. Lehman Sung. Preceding this, we will also be able to listen to a portion of the Q&A discussion of Mr. Sung with our AIM DBI startup founders. Let's listen to Sir Lehman Sung. A little bit about myself. I, I purposely said to keep the intro short because I'll, I'll, I'll talk about myself a little bit. So I am from the Manila Innovation Hub. We are part of Accenture. <clears throat> We're part of the Accenture Innovation Network, which is a global kind of group of innovation hubs, liquid studios you see in the background, um, and research labs who basically look, up, look at the, the future. You know, what is possible? What's happening in the world? What do we think is going to, to become the new normal? Um, the, you're like, it's almost like crystal ball world. We try and look in, into it and see what the trends will be. The one thing we didn't see or foresee was the pandemic but we did have some things ready which enabled us to try to pivot very very quickly to it so that's you know it's it's part of keeping us as a technology company agile and reactive or proactive sometimes okay um now a few of you might be thinking why is someone from the innovation enterprise transformation group here talking about data well that's because I was also the lead of the data studio. And I was also the AI lead before taking on this enterprise transformation role. So I have a very strong data background. I spent many years doing data architecture, data delivery of large projects. Um, and then I led AI here in Accenture for a year. Um, now I'm in enterprise transformation. Um, today, or tonight rather, not today, Tonight, I'm going to talk about two main topics. Um, the first one is data, the new capital. And this is a piece of research from Accenture of where data has really become core to business, to a lot of businesses, to the people we talk to at the C level and to the operational people. The second aspect of that is where AI is now entering the enterprise scale. Now, you know, I've seen some of the ideas here. And I know this kind of AIM's um, course is mostly around analytics, data science. So this is part of how do we get what was a niche area into the mainstream? How do we grow it? And in the bottom right, it's, it's a quote I quite like. So Paul Doherty is the head of Accenture technology. There, there are four streams in Accenture. Strategy consulting, which is one everyone knows about. Interactive, which is all about customer experience, digital marketing, SEO, that kind of world. Technology, which is one we all believe, every, half of the Philippines, Accenture in the Philippines is technology, and the other half is the last one, BPO. So Paul, Paul Doherty is the CEO of all of technology globally. 
And he is a very fascinating man. He's written a lot of books on AI. And he's very, very technical. He's a very technical person. And, you know, this quote, I think, comes from three years ago, where he's already talking about machine learning, the pattern matching of machine learning, and how it's superior to what we traditionally call the gut feel of humans. So this is like part of his foreshadowing a few years ago of where we, where we currently are at. Now, to learn about data and AI these days, data in the new capital, really need to look at the past. So if you look at 2010, that's, well, actually 2007 was the launch of big data. The term data lake was coined in 2007 um, by the Pentaho CTO, James Dixon. And then from there, data became really front and center. Before that, data was very much two, two types. You had operational data, which is your transactional, and you had warehousing, which is a small curated set of reporting data. With big data, you're now looking at everything else. The data that we used to discard loading into a warehouse. This is what big data would keep. From 2010 to 2015, it was mostly engineers building big data platforms. 2015 is when we started seeing use cases around the experimentation of little aspects of the big data. I mean, what I've just mentioned, we used to discard bad data loading into warehouse. The first one of the first ones was examining the bad data. What's wrong with it? What's happening upstream of your data, which is causing the problems? By 2020, last year, actually I would say this 2018, AI is starting to enter business functions. And then we see this married to the transition to cloud. Going to cloud allows you to scale, allows you to store a lot more data, and gives you all the compute needed for AI, advanced analytics and true AI. So that's kind of where we are now. And as you'll see, by 2015, AI will become everything. It will be prevalent in the world of autonomy will become pretty much the standard. You know, autonomous cars, autonomous delivery, um, edge computing, uh, drone, like fleets of drones delivering that kind of stuff. You know, where we are right now is just there. We're just starting to move from AI entering every business function to being at the core of every business function, which means it's, it's actually a really exciting time. Um, one of the aspects of this though, is we actually see AI and data no longer as being the cutting edge. So one of the things I wanna bring up here, this is our, what we call the tech vision. <clears throat> Every year we identify five major trends and we always look at it in a three year cycle. So currently this year, we have these five. It's all about your architectural stack. Uh, mirrored world is digital twin, where you use advanced analytics to predict behavior of a machine, of a car, of a uh, drilling machine, of a ship, that kind of stuff. Technologist is how we get <clears throat> everyone enabled on technology, where we democratize AI, we democratize modeling, all those advanced things. How do we bring it to the masses? Anywhere, any, everywhere is all about bring your own environment. It's about this, the fact that I'm sat in my condo, I'm not in my office, and so are you. No one's in an office. So you can basically remote work from anywhere. Um, and from me to you, from me to we, is about um, frictionless, boundaryless data sharing, which is based on distributed ledger blockchain. Now, if you go down to 2019, DARQ, dark power, the first D in that is distributed ledger. So you can see in 2019, 2021, distributed ledger goes from dark power <clears throat> to innovation DNA, to from me to we. So you see the evolution of it coming into the mainstream. And if you look across these, um, you'll see data in a lot of this. When we present tech vision to clients, very often the data leads present because data is through it. You know, look at 2020, AI and me, smart things. Uh, innovation DNA is all based around data. 2019, dark, get to know me as customer 360. Human plus worker is AI enabled working. So things like automation, things like um, AI functionally helping your day-to-day -day work. 
and my markets is all about real-time analytics. So you can see that data has been a very large trend up until 2021. So we are now at the tipping point of becoming mainstream, which is very, very exciting because we're, st we're still at the cusp of it with a lot of opportunity to really influence the world. Okay, so th this is just the background. Um, let me go on to the actual topics. Data is new capital. And this is a, what we're thinking about, where data is actually going to be part of your balance sheet, right? Which is, if you think about it, data is an intangible thing. It doesn't exist. But now it becomes something which C-suite will need to measure, will need to track, okay? 84% of the market value of the top 500 companies will come from these intangible assets. Think of a Google. Google doesn't own anything. Google's software, software and data and information. That's, and it's also one of the world's most valuable companies. You look at someone like Apple, the world's first trillion dollar company. Yes, lots of physical devices, phones, laptops, um, tablets, watches, ear pods, but the vast majority of their value are things like um, Apple Music, Apple TV, the, um, you know, the Apple Store. All of that is digital world, nothing physical, but that's their value. That's why they got to trillion dollars. And the way we are thinking about data is at the C level, to a CEO, there are four main prescriptions, four elements that must be dealt with in order to become a data-led company. And these are the four. Data analytic strategy, knowing what you want to do and making that data and analytics at the core of what you want to do. A lot of times you'll hear that data strategy is business strategy. That's becoming the new phrase, which I see a lot uh, across not just ourselves, but industry. The second thing is building up the right capability, building up data and analytics, not just having a small team doing it, but making a lot of business decisions based on it. So this is where they need to invest, to sink money into it and build something which will enable data analytics across the entire enterprise. The third thing is the management. And this, this is very large. Globally, we've seen a lot of secure data laws, rules kind of coming in. Things like GDPR, which has controls personal data. So it's now becoming very important to manage the data. As, as data grows, it must be managed, protected, governed well. The Philippines DPA Data Protection Act is actually pretty good. Um, it's very comprehensive. It's based on probably two or three of the better data protection rules globally. However, the implementation of the governance is the biggest question. When that first court case happens, I always wonder what's gonna what's gonna be the output. And we've seen people like Google being fined millions of dollars. What will happen here? And it's it's a very important thing because data starts becoming international. I'm from the UK. My data is held under GDPR. So the fact that I'm a Globe subscriber, they should be protecting my data to the same level. Should be. And then the final element is the culture and literacy. And this is the pervasiveness of your data analytics. Everyone should be able to use it. It's no longer the remit of a data analytics team to produce reports. Everyone should have self-service. They should understand how to access data, how to read it themselves. These are the four pillars which come, which we, we think make up a good kind of C-level control and understanding of data to enable a data-led company. And what happens if you don't do it? Well, we're seeing that right now. If you look at the bottom, the current focus, you'll recognize a lot of these because it's it's the hot stuff. AI, machine learning, data supply chain, management. I've just talked about it. But all of those are short-term tactical solutions. Look at the ones above, the gaps. These are the gaps which are current, we see missing in a lot of companies. The culture, the processes behind it, the business value. The current focus is all technology. The ones above, that's really where the value is, business, culture, and process, because that is the core of any company. The ones underneath, the current focus, that's IT, but IT doesn't generate value. 
the business, whatever business, is the thing that generates value. And if you take the business culture and process, what you can do is actually distill it into, these are the three, I call them strategic imperatives, but this is a blueprint of what you need. And you'll see, you'll see the similarity between the C-suite and the organizational level here, where you have to understand, first of all, the value. What, what can you use data for? What's your vision and where, you, where is your data gonna generate value for your business? Is it going to be like um, Grab? Grab understanding that I like fried chicken like the rest of this country. Therefore, if you offer me fried chicken on a deal, I will buy it. And if you offer me like three days worth of those deals, I will buy for three days. But if you offer me on fourth day, I might not, I might be tired of fried chicken, so skip a day. That's, that's the business impact. To enable that, you need the data and AI platform in the middle. This is the IT bit. This is the process. This is putting in the right platforms and technology to deliver the value needed. And then to make it all work together, you need the people, the culture, the ways of working, data literacy. Can people use the data well? You know, are you bringing in the right people? Are you giving them the right training? And that's something which, you know, we only recently are we seeing a shift in the market. Data literacy is a very hot topic this, this year. And it's, I'm not talking about, oh, data scientists. We need people who are ML engineers, who know all the algorithms, can explain to me what a Saramax is. It's not that. It's the, can, I, can my manager understand the spreadsheet, which is now put onto a dashboard? And if not, how can I make that easier? Can I build a report which is easy to understand? And this could be as simple as highlighting the important area. You know, like, is, is an account about to you know, end and it needs to be you know, restarted? You need to cross-sell, upsell into that account. Just something as simple as that is data literacy. Using a tool to identify that account which is nearing end of life, is about to churn. So that's, these are the three things which are needed for an organization to become data-led. Okay. Um, organizations, though, it's all about size. What I've been describing is kind of nice, nice theories, but it's all about scaling. You know, like, and this is this I find a very interesting stat because it comes from Gartner, and it's Gartner C-suite survey. Gartner, based everyone answers to Gartner because they are the world's largest market kind of research company. So if you look at this. Every C-suite executive understands the importance of data. Almost every C-suite executive worries about scaling. And if you go back to the history, you know, we started big data, we went into the first use cases, now we're seeing AI deployed in a lot of business areas, and the next one is AI everywhere. That's the scale. That curve is the scale, and that's the current challenge we're seeing. So Let's talk about how you scale AI. And I'm gonna go quite quickly because I realize I'm running out of time. Sorry, Angela. Um, sorry, Robin. So when we talk about scaling, we always measure companies that strategically scale versus just proof of concepts. And let me, let me grind this a bit. So a proof of concept is where there's a lot of small ideas coming up. And in a startup world, th these are your ideas. These are the ones which have value and individually will you know will solve a lot of problems and will bring a lot of value to, to to a client the second step is where the clients need to get the strategic scaling and it's all about connecting the ideas together so if i take pass a job if i take um I forget i forget the other names pass jobs you know, stuck with me if i take that and i have a different one which is all around the hiring process, I have NLP driven access to uh, interviews, and I put it together, that's when I start scaling because I'm, my teams are now working together. We're deploying multiple AI solutions, which will intelligently take on a lot of the work, which right now HR people have to do. We have to talk to each other. We have to understand, is this person a fit for this job? So on and so forth. So this is where 
we take a small scale, connect it together, start putting structure around it, understand the maturity of it, and start moving up the scale. The industrialized growth, you know, number three, that's very rare. There's, I think from our survey, only 5% of companies claim to be industrializing AI for growth. Um, and they're going to be the ones who are very specific for AI. So things like Google will do this. Those are, that's the kind of level who will do it. Okay, um, I'm going to skip on a bit here, square of time. In terms of scaling, these are the three like critical steps you must take. And think of it for in terms of your startup going into the bigger corporate world. Intentional AI is around the idea of having a strategy, having a vision for your um, for your AI, for your solution. It can't it can't just be a that's nice we'll deploy it. It must be a this will solve a business problem which will let us get to the next level, which will generate this amount of value. And this is like having buy-in from leadership, from C-suite, from directors, or saying this is something which is needed. The second one, tuning out data noise, is all around having the right data foundation. Being able to say, this is good data for my models, this is bad data, but I will use this to train my model in the right way. I'll take our bias, I will have the most complete model I can have. And this is difficult because very often data itself is biased. It's trying to find the right data, which is very difficult at times. And we ourselves have it. You know, very often if we're ever doing HR kind of work, we use ourselves as as the data. You know, there's 30,000 Accenture technology people, 30,000 Accenture BPS. That's 60,000 data points I can get hold of if HR lets me. So it's all about getting the right data, understanding it, curating it, and then using it to train your model right, and then running it. And the last one, AI is a team sport. This is the, the one of the other critical areas of scaling. It's putting these different silos of AI together. So there's a bit of it everywhere. And as each one matures, overall, your entire organization will mature. One of the interesting aspects of this study, though, is the roadblocks. The lack of budget, and I talk budgets a lot with clients, you know, they are willing to invest in AI. It's the hot topic. It's always on people's strategic roadmaps, but at a very high level. The actual creation of it is a difficult step. So it's not, it's not, it's not the budget which matters. It's the organization, it's the support, it's moving from this is the world as it currently is, to this is the world we want it to be. And that's very challenging because people do not like change. They're comfortable, the business operations are comfortable. If it changes, people don't like it. So that's all we, culture is a critical aspect of scaling and growing AI within companies. Um, this is the last, this is kind of like the last slide I'll cover, it's the takeaway. And the important bit is the one on the right, the purple bit. It's the purpose, speed in the right direction. It's not just about moving as fast as you can. It's got to be in the right direction. The money is you've got to invest in the right areas. You're the ones that add value. Data. You need the right data. The right insights from the right data. Because if you have the wrong data, your insights are wrong, you do not get business advantage out of it. And then the last one is the culture. It's, it's not even leader, it's just, it's not even a single team. It's about the culture going across everywhere it needs to go to. And that doesn't need to be an every, you know, next day thing. It can be a slow process, but understanding the strategic growth and direction to go into. So, so if you can see my screen, um, uh, the, I can read the first question here. So to make decisions based on data, you need volume, but early age startups struggle with having enough data. So I think that was covered in your last, in the last question. Yeah. Um, so the next one, hi, Elam, how do you get to be an innovation lead with a data background? How do you train your left brain and your right brain to be both analytical and creative at the same time? Oh, someone's asking hard questions on a Friday night. <laughs> <laughs> I need to get a beer. Um, that is, that's a great question. 
I am going to say something which makes me sound crazy, but so don't worry, don't worry. I am not honest, but it's all about the mindset or the viewpoint, right? So my early history developer became an, uh, an architect. So engineering, engineering, engineering. When you get to architect, your mind needs to change a bit because you need to start becoming a bit creative. Okay, we we do a personality test in our design thinking um, kind of start at the start of every design thinking session, every workshop. We answer a series of questions to see what people's mindsets are, and it's like athlete driven to goals, um, creative, kind of dreams big, engineer thinks of constraints, thinks of what can't be done. And then the sage, which brings people together. I always come out as mostly sage, which I think is a factor of my my level, my responsibilities, and my staging career. But if you go to the architects, they're always half creative, half engineering. You go to the developers, they're all engineering, right? So I've been all of those in my career. It it's something that evolves because when you're a developer, you know what is possible. In the in the realms of what you're working on, when you become an architect, you have to start thinking about putting putting the possibilities together. When you become a, what we call an enterprise architect, when you're dealing with multiple platforms, multiple systems, that's when you start getting in the creative world. So it's almost like I've trained my brain to switch on both sides. One thing I do notice is sometimes I kind of get caught between the two, and I will ping pong from one to the other. So it is, it's, it's what mindset do you catch yourself on? And I'm trying to make sure I've got the right one switched on at the right time. That's also a struggle sometimes. Does that answer it? It's a bit crazy. I, I, I sound like a crazy person, I think. Uh, no, you don't too. I think that's fine. <laughs> so to the anonymous person who sent that question, I hope that that, that answers your question. Um, so for the next one, you mentioned noise. Should we start by measuring everything? What would be considered noise for us? So, yeah. So, yes, measure everything. That's one of the things. You must measure everything. You don't know what noise is right, at the start, but the signal, the important data, can only be defined whenever you understand what the problem is and how you want to fix it. So up until you define that, everything is noise everything a signal but whenever you take your data set and you have a specific problem then you pick out what is a signal inside if you have a different problem a different use case those signals will become noise right so it's always from that it's a viewpoint thing again it's always from a viewpoint but as long as you have everything you can't go wrong this is this is the entire theory of data lakes store everything at once Use it many times for whatever purpose, as compared to the old way of data data warehouses, when you pick only the data you need to process your reporting. Okay, hope that helps. Thank you, sir. Um, sadly, I think we've run out of time for the Q and A, but these are very two. These are very good questions. These remaining two. So, if it's all right, sir, maybe you could type the answers. Um, yeah, yeah, I can do that. All right. So thank you, Sir Elam. Um, or Elian, anything you want to close this session with? Um, maybe a, a, a final question. I'm I'm very curious to hear your <laughs> thoughts, um, Sir, Sir Elam. Um, and then we'll go through the the, the the IWD stuff quickly. But um, yeah, in terms of your exposure and having looked across, you know, the 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 the, the landscape in the Philippines of businesses working with data. What do you see as the biggest data challenges here? And what are the implications for early stage startups? The lack of data in the Philippines. So if you notice those open data sources I'm talking about are usually international. Um, one of the things that we have in the Liquid Studio is we have this application. Ah, do I have it on this laptop? No, this laptop can't run it. We have an application which which current which monitors the current state of Singapore. So if we were in the office right now, if we were doing this in the Liquid Studio, I would go up to our big touchscreen wall, which is nine TVs, nine big 60-inch TVs, 
which we put a touchscreen filter on, and I would bring up a dashboard which shows the weather, the traffic, the taxis, the state of building, our building at least, um, in Singapore. So it's a connected city, it's a smart city. Manila, I couldn't even do that. I couldn't even pull up those traffic cameras because if, it, if the camera's working, the data is siloed. So that, for me, is an example of a, it's a microcosm of the whole of the Philippines where data is not available, it's not connected yet. However, I will say that I see change. I see departments such as uh, the agriculture department. Um, we did a big piece of work with the agriculture department. Um, it was CSR, right at the start of the pandemic, about the food supply. So we see them starting to join it up. Farmers to supply chain to consumers. And by consumers, I mean supermarkets, palenques, that kind of thing. I, there's, a, there's an app, I think it's called Bayaniha. Yeah, the Department of Agriculture app, which is starting to connect up farmers to markets, to suppliers and all that. It's starting to break the silos. It's, it's the long journey, but a start, the first step is always needed. So I think that that's kind of be going to be key. Does that answer your question? Yes, I think I think thank you very much for that. Yeah. So we hope you're able to pick up a thing or two uh, for Mr. LM and the Q and A discussion after. At this point, we hope you're excited about pursuing your how for data. And what would be a better step than joining our Innovate with Data community? Presently, our workshops are running with the AIM DBI companies exclusively, but if you sign up at the link provided, we will connect with you and find ways for you to join our program. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. If you, if you would like to reach out to us for questions or collaborations, please do not hesitate to contact us at innovate-with-data.escolabs.com. Follow us on social media our website, Facebook, and LinkedIn to know more about our programs and projects. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you.